We do lift those folks up, uh, just like uh, we lift uh, all those folks out there that will be tuning in on uh, our YouTube channel out there. And uh, we hope and pray that uh, the Lord will continue to bless you as well as we uh, continue and we we go in to, to be finishing out uh, basically this book of Philippians. We are in the last uh, bit of it and uh, and things, so we need to uh, continue to, to uh, appreciate that. And we look to uh, back in chapter 4, the last chapter of the book of Philippians, and we find uh, in verse number 10, we're, we're in verses 11 and 12, but in verse 10 it says, Paul said, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were all so careful, but you lacked opportunity. And, uh, you know, the, the sense of Paul's need it has been renewed in their lives and things. And uh, uh, as Christians, we face opportunities almost every single day to serve Christ. And at times, we lack concern sometimes to take advantage of those opportunities. And I believe that, you know, that's, that's what Paul is getting at here to them is don't let those opportunities go by. Uh, You've got to act on those things when, when they're presented themselves. Don't, don't waste your opportunities to be a blessing. Uh, life is not a series of accidents, but it is a series of appointments. And uh, we don't need to miss our appointments for blessings, for sure. We need to let the Lord guide and direct our life. And uh, Paul continues there in verses 11 and 12. And he says, Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So basically, when he's talking about their, them not letting an opportunity go by to be a blessing, now he's clarifying. He, he says that he's clarifying that that is in the Christian work. He's not telling them that that they need to try to do anything for him, because Paul says that he says not that I speak in respect of one. So he's telling them. I look, I'm not talking that I need anything because I've learned. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So we look at this state of satisfaction, if you will. As long as Paul was doing the work of Jesus, he was satisfied. He had all that he needed. Because he knew, he trusted in the Lord Jesus to keep him in his, uh, and to take care of him. And, uh, you know, most people, they seek contentment. But many seek it in things or in possessions. Uh, and when we, when we say most people, we, that, that means, yes, even, even Christians as well sometimes. Uh, you know, true contentment is only found in one place, and that's found in the Lord Jesus. Paul knew that. He learned that. And uh, Paul's writing from prison, and yet we find that he's still content. I don't need anything. The Lord put me here, and I'm still being of service to the Lord. Because you can guarantee that even in prison, Paul's telling everybody that comes in about Jesus and, and uh, the house of Caesar and things. Uh, life does not consist of what you possess. 
God is not impressed with our, our possessions or our accomplishments. He's impressed with our obedience and faithfulness to Him. To God, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter to Him what we have as long as we're faithful. We can have nothing and be faithful and it would please God. We could have the world. But as long as we're faithful in using what we have to help to bless others, that's what pleases God. Uh, in Luke 12, in verse uh, number 15, it says, And He said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8 says, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. You know, Timothy was, he was a, a student. He was a, 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 a protege. He was an apprentice, basically, of Paul. And so we look, he, he has about the same mindset that Paul does about these things. Now I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying I don't believe uh, any other uh, someone that uh, or, or that uh, is learned and all those things of Bible and the things of God and all that. Uh, I don't believe that that any of them would would. Uh, go against it, but you know, having having things is not wrong. I mean, if the Lord blesses us and to where we can do those things, then hey, I believe the Lord wants us to have those things. But when it's when we put those things above Him, now that's where the problem comes in. Or we put the, we we take those things and we don't share the blessing that God has given us upon other people. That's where the problem lies. Paul says here, he says that he has learned there in verse 11, now that I speak in uh, respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He has learned. He's learned the secret of being content. Basically, the very learning indicates that it was a learning by experience. It's not something that just come to Paul, you know, and uh, just boom, there it is. Oh, I'm content. He learned what it was like to be content. I mean, there were times, probably, as uh, in his walk with Jesus, that. He was, I mean, he'd have things. There were other times he didn't have nothing. We look at, at Jesus himself. And uh, he had nothing but the clothes on his back. So, I mean, uh, we look in and through these things. This was a, a learning by experience. And not to say that sometimes, even for the Apostle Paul, we could, we could uh, I believe that we could probably, if he could testify to us, he'd tell us, hey, and many a times it was not an easy lesson to learn. It was hard to learn. But by experience, I learned it. And by experience, he learned to live above his circumstances. By going through good and difficult times in his life. Now there were times in, in, Paul, in Paul's life where probably everything was going pretty good. And then there were times in Paul's life when everything was going pretty right. I mean, you just don't get uh, beat as much as he did and get thrown into jail like he did numerous times. And, and all these things and just not learn something from it. 
So he, he learned to live above his circumstances. And the only way that he could live and learn that is the same way he's trying to tell them to learn to live that way. And that's by trusting in the Lord. Not to worry, but trusting in the Lord. So even as he learned these things through good and difficult circumstances, he did learn what it was like to be content. The word content means to be entirely self-sufficient or independent of external circumstances. To be self-sufficient or contained. This word was used to describe a country that supplied itself and had no need of imports. If, if literally, if things were done in the right perspective and in the right way, now we could say that the state of Texas was a state that could be content. Because we wouldn't have to rely on anybody for anything. We got our own oil and we got our own gas and we got natural gas. We got all the minerals and things that it takes to do things with people and all that. We could say that, hey, we could be content. You know, this word content is a description of the man whose resource are within him so that he does not have to depend upon substitutes without. Our sufficiency is found in one place. And it's in Christ Jesus who meets all of our needs. Not some, not one or a couple here or there, but He is capable of meeting all of our needs. The word content was used by the uh, Stoic school of philosophy and was one of their favorite ones. The highest aim of a Stoic was to be self-sufficient. He desired little and did not possess very many things. The Stoic would say, I will be content by an act of my own will. Contentment was considered a human achievement. And yet for Paul, now, for Paul, it was a gift from God. And that's what he wants the church in Philippi to realize. That's what he wants you and I to realize. That we will never be content of ourselves on our own. Because we're always going to want something else and, and never be totally content. But it's only when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus where we can find true contentment in the lives in which we live. It was part of God's provision for His life. The Stoic was self-sufficient. Paul was God-sufficient. There's a difference. When we're relying on self or are we relying on God? The Stoic relied on himself. Paul relied on God. The Christian should rely on God. The man of the world relies on himself. You see the, the correlation there? Uh, in... Uh, you know, satisfaction is, is in the Lord is a great asset. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6 it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. So what does it mean to be content? Content is an inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of our outward circumstances. You know, there, there, there can be those that can say, boy, 
uh, so and so sure is content with his life. Well, that's because mostly they're relying on God and not on their self. It's being at peace in spite of our circumstances. Not in lieu of our circumstances, but in spite of it. No matter how traumatic our life is going, the contented person has an inner strength and peace. Contentment is not escape from the battle, but rather an abiding peace and confidence in the midst of the battle. Contentment is not escape from the battle, but rather an abiding peace and confidence in the midst of the battle. You know, it's kind of, it, it's just like uh, uh, John Wayne's description of courage. John Wayne said that, that courage is being scared and saddling up anyway. So that's the same thing. Your contentment was one of the highest Greek qualities. To the Greeks it meant that you were sufficient in yourself. Christians made the word to mean a sufficiency in Jesus. Contentment grows from our attitude toward God and living life his way according to his word. Contentment is not apathy or foolishness. It is a quiet restfulness in the midst of changing events. If we would really look around and really be honest with ourselves today, if there was ever a time that we needed to, that Christians needed to be content in in Christ Jesus is today. I mean, you look around us, and you want to talk about chaos and all of those things, all the changing events, all of the changing things we're here. What we're supposed to go by, what we're not supposed to go by. Oh, well, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about, and and oh, but this guy over here doesn't know. That guy doesn't know. We we know, and, and you know, I know one that knows what he's talking about, and that's Jesus. And one of these days, this old world won't make a difference. They can have all the stuff and everything else. Uh, godliness does not give uh, financial gain all the time. Well, I know that. Godliness itself is gain when it is accompanied with content. Godliness is a gain in itself because it has the promise of blessing now and in eternity, according to Psalm chapter 1. Good. Godliness does not come and go with the uncertainties of material wealth. Amen. Whether you're rich or poor, you can still be a godly person. Godliness with contentment is the wealth that you have that is independent of your checkbook or your possessions. You can have nothing and be rich if you find contentment in the Lord Jesus. For many, contentment is rare and difficult to attain. Circumstances are frequently difficult and our hearts are unhealthily restless. We're too dependent upon this world and its fortunes influence us. 
It's the same. All right, we, we, Sunday we talked about, we were in chapter 2. As we began, we, we, were, we went through from verse basically 1 through 7. We're going to pick up in 8 this coming Sunday morning. So anyway, but we look at, at, at those verses and we find that we're going to find as we move into chapter 3 in the book of Genesis here in the next couple of weeks. Because there's some things that that we need to see. But as we begin to look in these things, we find that that was one of the things that Satan lured Eve with. He can he took her contentment away from her. And he put it on something that Basically, she didn't have, but she turned to find out that that's what she wanted. Satan told her in chapter 3 that, hey, uh, you can turn around and uh, if you'll partake of the fruit, for one, surely you won't die, like God said. And two, you shall be like. God. See, many people, I believe in this, they, they think that Eve was gullible and she just fell for Satan's uh, tricks and those things. Now, she fell for his, his deception, for sure. But we also find that she, she fell from her own desires as well. Because I believe what Satan said is what got her. Not that she wouldn't die, but that she would be like God. And I think that was the turning point for Eve. She had a desire. And that desire that perhaps she never had was now unlocked within her by Satan's deceptions. And that nature, the sin nature, came into play. And now it's, oh, if I eat this fruit, I'm going to be like God. And often, I've read that, I've read those, that account over and over and over and over again. And I never really noticed it too much either that or I really didn't pay attention because I, I knew the story, you know, and I, I, I knew the thing. But I got to I got to realizing it, and once you really get to, to reading into verse three, you catch bits and pieces that you've never seen before. Probably because the, the story is so familiar to the Christian. Because we've heard it, you know, however many times. But I got to noticing something. When I got to noticing was this. And I'm not going to give away anything, but anyway. Uh, let me find. It. Hold on. Just give me one one moment. Here it is. Let's see. Uh, in verse 5, in chapter 3 in the book of Genesis says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, be, be a god, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. I've read that over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. And I've studied and I've heard uh, and, it, and it says, and she gave unto her husband with her and he did eat. You know, I never really paid any attention, I guess, to the two words of with her. 
Or you know how you read the scripture and you because you know the story or you know what it's talking about and you you kind of skim it, you know. Even if you're studying it, you still skim it and and you you'll you'll go right over something. And I guess all these years I've gone over the two words of with her. Adam knew what God had said. He got it directly from God. And yet we find that when, you know, I've always kind of did, did this, you know, she did it, and then she gave it later as he come in and said, oh, what'd you do? You know, and then he ate it too because he loved her so much that he, he would be willing to take the blame or, or take the heat, the heat for her. But that's not the case. We find that by those two words, we find that he was right there. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, what did you do, woman? It wasn't that way at all. And by him eating, now whether he loved her enough to want to try to to realize what she had done to take the heat off of her so that he could take the blame or, or whatever the case may be, she wouldn't have to face God's anger and all that on her own, you know, even though after all she was made from him, from one of his ribs, you know. So however this goes, I mean, he was right there. He had a desire. He had a desire just like she did, I believe. You know, yeah. Man, I'll be like God. I, I'll ever bring wisdom. Now, she may have not have been, he may have not have heard what Satan had told her. I mean, we don't really know. We know the point that it says that he was there. So, so we find in this, right? We don't find that they were content at where God had made them. God had formed them. God had breathed life into them. Give them a soul, a spirit. Gave them the whole garden. Except for one stupid and it's not stupid, but you know what I'm saying. They had everything they could eat of, is what the Bible said. Everything but one tree. And they and they turned around, and that's the one they had to have. Now look. Now look at what Paul says. Paul in this says. Not that I speak in retrospect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am there with. In that state, no matter what it is, if it's good, bad, ugly, whatever, to be content. Adam and Eve didn't look at the state that they were in and realize that they were the apple of God's eye that they were all that 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 meant to, to God. They weren't content. They didn't learn their lesson. But they did learn it. And we'll see that when on, on whatever Sunday that is coming up that we hear that. We will learn it because we find in this that they were that they did have a hope. Oh, real nice. You're going to start it, but you're not going to finish. That, that means, if you want to, as Paul Harvey said, <laughs> you want the rest of the story. <laughs> you got to come to get it. Okay? But anyway, so we, we, we look at this. It, contentment is rare. And it's difficult to attain. 
Circumstances are frequently difficult and our hearts are restless. Without contentment, the most prosperous circumstances bring no joy or pleasure. With contentment, the poorest circumstances can produce little distress, if any. That's where we find Paul. Look at where he is. His days are numbered. He's in prison. He doesn't know exactly what's coming his way. He got a good idea. and But he was content in where he was because he was still doing God's work where he was and how he was. There is a secret of contentment. We are to realize the secret of true contentment. Paul reveals what the secret is in Philippians chapter 4. Notice again in verses 11 through 13, he says, Not that I speak in retrospect or in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to be, how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to bound be both both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. No matter what position he was in, he learned the true secret. Of content. And that's the Lord Jesus. We trust in Him. Man, he, 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 he says, you know, I learned that whether I'm in need, I'm content. I'm to be content. Whether I have plenty, I'm to be content. If I'm Rich, I'm to be content. If I'm poor, I'm to be content. If I'm anywhere in the middle between all of that somewhere, I'm to be content. If my circumstances in life are terrible, I'm sitting here in prison, I'm to be content. If I'm sitting here in the very presence of Jesus my Lord and Savior, I'm to be content. Paul wants them to realize what he wants you and I to realize. Contentment does not arrive by chance. It is not inherited, purchased, or a product of discipline. It is learned, as Paul says. To be content when one circumstance is a thing to be desired. To be content with oneself is a thing to be dreaded. If we become content with our spiritual condition, our spiritual growth will be hindered and we will not be thirsty for righteousness and a close walk with God. Paul reveals the source of contentment is found in the Lord Jesus. He speaks of the conditions of contentment in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6 verse 8 says, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Our helpful discipline in contentment involves distinguishing. This reason why Paul says it was a learned thing. All right? We got to learn to distinguish between needs and wants. We'll go in, we'll go in some place, whether it be Bass Pro Academy, gun shop, whatever, or some place, you know, I, that sells all the stuff I, I like to look at. And Lori will say, Would you find anything? And my word, I tell her, and you can ask her, I'll tell her the same thing every time. I always find something. But don't mean I'm going to buy nothing. 
I find it, but it don't mean I'm going to get it. Yeah, but your thinking's always is always aimed at me. No, not really. You know, average, average, adversitizing tries to make our wants sound like our needs. Adversities try to make our our wants sound like they're our needs. The yearning for mature riches as if they could satisfy the soul is condemned. He, he's not condemning wealth. Some of the greatest men in scriptures were wealthy men. I mean, look at it. Abraham, Job, King David. They controlled their wealth. It did not control them. Paul is stressing the importance of being grateful and content with food and clothing, which are basic needs. If we lose them, we lose the ability to secure other things. A miser without food would starve to death, counting his money. Everybody knows old uh, Ebenezer, don't you? Old Scrooge. Henry David... Troa, uh, Troa, uh, Troa reminded us that a man is wealthy in proportion to the number of things that he can do without. Be content with food and raiment is what Paul is telling them. With the needed things. Paul knew how to be abased or to live on little are humble means. And he knew how to abound. Which means exceed, excel, overflow, to be fattened like an animal. We, we, we learned back when we first started this uh, uh, book of Philippians. We learned of the characteristics of Paul. We learned of his resume, basically. Of how he testified of what he was, how he was. Not. Paul had everything that someone could want. But when he found Jesus, he realized that none of that stuff matters. Just Jesus. Paul trusted in Christ in times of poverty and in times of plenty. It is believed that Paul became a wealthy, uh, from a wealthy family from the tribe of Benjamin, being trained by Gamaliel, uh, would be considered costly according to Acts 22 and verse 3. When things are going poorly for Christians, some tend to whine, pine, or recline. They also gripe, grumble, or gossip as they blame others for their predicament. Paul, however, learned the secret of being content. When we realize that God is watching over us, and is in control of our lives, it will help us to be content. God's guidance is taught repeatedly in Scripture. We close with Proverbs 16, verse 9. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord di directeth his steps. Jeremiah 10, verse 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. See, Paul's trying to tell them. 23. Paul's trying to tell them that, hey, man, y'all got to realize where you are, the very blessings that you have. Because God is blessing. And if He's blessing you, then He's given you the ability. And He's given you the command to be a blessing. Be blessed and be a blessing. That's what He wanted them to realize. 
So anyway, uh, that'll give you some previews of some things uh, on the, uh, for Sundays to come. So uh, I hope that you'll count those things. You say, man, i got to hear more about this or uh, whatever. But, you know, uh, the Lord has a lot to say to us and we do the best we can to present it. So, uh, so let's go ahead and, and pray and we can be dismissed this evening. Dear Lord, we do count it such a blessing once again. Lord, just to be able to come into Your house in, here in the middle of the week, Lord, to throw the, uh, the things of the world aside, even if just for a little while and the problems and the tribulations and things that come. Lord, I pray that You'd help us to realize what contentment is all about. And Lord, that uh, we've been receptive to what Paul was not only telling the church at Philippi, but that God was telling through him to us as well. Lord, continue to be with those on our prayer list. Uh, Watch over them, Lord, and uh, we pray that You'd have Your will and way, Lord, in each and every circumstance. Just be with us now as we go our separate ways, and, and Lord, that You would just help us to uh, uh, stay safe, Lord, until we, we reach our destination this evening. And Lord, uh, we do pray that You would help to begin even tonight, Lord, as we leave, to prepare us, Lord, for what You'd have for us this coming week again, Lord, as we come back into Your house. Lord, we love You. We thank You for it's in the precious and the holy name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen.